Hey everybody, Nick here from 4PlayerNetwork.com and host of 4Player Podcast, and it's that time again. These are my 10 favorite games of 2014. Alright, so I'm going to kick things off this year with a game that falls pretty far outside of my wheelhouse. Future Lab's super fast-paced shoot-em-up platformer hybrid Velocity 2X triggered a completionist personality in me that I rarely ever see. It's one of the few games that I played despite having a throwaway story because the gameplay that drives the experience is just so damn fun. So fun, in fact, that I often found myself replaying levels as soon as I finished them just to challenge myself to get a faster time or a higher score. And let me be clear... I never do that. But the game really shines thanks to its split personality. The game quite literally splits the experience between bullet hell action and some of the fastest and most demanding on-foot platforming I've ever played. In fact, these transitions happen mid-level by forcing you to dock your ship and then complete platforming challenges on foot in order to unlock new paths back in the flight portions of the levels. The game does this several times per level and requires you to not only be on your toes, but to remember the layout of the levels and use that knowledge to accomplish faster runs. I love all of the different tools and abilities that are in play, too. The fluid dash mechanic allows you to bypass short distances regardless of any obstacles that stand in your path. The teleportation device can be thrown to allow for instantaneous backtracking or even used to navigate tight passages. And there are just so many different intricate tools and abilities that are challenging and fun to use. Hell, it's another shining example of what the Vita can actually do given the chance, and like last year's Guacamelee, it's a beautiful example of how the PS3 and PS4 cross-play functionality is one of the most forward-thinking concepts in the industry today. Bayonetta is a game that I hardly expected to resonate with Western audiences, much less garner a full-blown sequel. Platinum Games went ahead and surprised everyone by not only announcing that the follow-up to their insane Bayonetta franchise was an actual thing, but it would also be coming exclusively to the Wii U. Now, what effect would Nintendo have on this hyper-violent and titular franchise? To this character, even. Happily, Bayonetta is a, every bit as sexy, powerful, and unapologetic about it as ever before, if not more so. She still has a skin-tight suit made of her own bewitched hair, she still slays demons and angels while pole dancing, she still transforms her hair into powerful monsters that gleefully devour her angelic foes as blood rains from the sky, she still struts her stuff all over the battlefield with pride, effectively laughing and rejecting the notion that all sexy female characters these days are shallow and oftentimes shameful creations. And she does all this with an electric attitude that is as fun as hell to watch on screen. On the other hand, it's easy to look at a game like Bayonetta 2 and knock it for not innovating much on the original. With that said, Bayonetta 1 was already so over the top and so perfectly crafted, it's hard to imagine actually topping it. Much like the original, though, Bayonetta 2 continues to be one of the most perfectly honed character action games, period. The witch time mechanic is every bit as imperative and addicting to master as it was before, and it's simple enough to execute that even the most casual player can feel in complete control. While some of the boss fights felt less inspired this time around, others proved to be some of the most intense and exhilarating boss fights in the genre. In the end, I was a little let down by how safe they played it this time around, but the combat system, presentation, and the generous bonus disc on the Wii U featuring the first game was more than enough to solidify a spot on my list. And did I mention her new haircut? Because, oh my god. Watch Dogs is sure to be looked back on as one of the most controversial games in recent years, thanks to the lofty promises made by Ubisoft that it's unveiling, and the disappointment that it was met with when the game finally hit shelves. The concept, though, is rock solid. Empower the player with godlike hacking abilities in an open world that is woven together and powered by networking technology, and then task them with toppling a government conspiracy. The experience practically writes itself, and the possibilities did seem endless. What we ended up with, though, was a game that can't help but be compared to Grand Theft Auto with a few exciting new tricks up its sleeve. But, as I always do, I prefer to praise a game for what it is rather than tear it down for what it is not. And what Watch Dogs is is an incredibly polished and entertaining sandbox. 
The game is arguably a one-trick pony, but when that trick is being able to remotely manipulate technology on the fly and use it to turn the tides in a firefight or evade pursuers in a high-speed car chase, I can hardly say that bothers me. These elements were a ton of fun and blended beautifully with the more traditional third-person action stylings of a game like Grand Theft Auto. As a new IP that Ubisoft is sure to milk for years to come, it's not surprising that the plot was somewhat lacking. I enjoyed the tone and the character's motivations, hell, I even enjoyed most of the supporting cast, but the protagonist himself fell a little flat, leaving plenty of room for improvement in the inevitable sequel. It's a series that seems destined to follow this, a similar trajectory as the Assassin's Creed franchise. When all is said and done, though, the important thing here is that you can cause blackouts with your phone, and that is just one of the coolest damn things I did in a video game all year long. So, aside from creating some of my favorite original horror IPs last generation, such as Fear and Condemned, Monolith has always been fun to watch because they never fail to leave their own mark on every project they take on. Even their brief foray into the Batman universe was anything but predictable. This year's Middle-Earth Shadow of Mordor further substantiated this claim and got the whole industry worked up by producing one of the first examples of what it might actually mean to be next-gen. On the surface, it's easy to identify similarities with other successful franchises. The combat and world traversal are both iterations of those found in games like Assassin's Creed and Batman, but in both cases, I found their execution here to be as good, if not better. In the case of the combat, the thick layer of gruesome violence that was laid on top felt appropriate and helped give the game its own identity. It was also incredible to see them tackle the free running and traversal, and essentially solve all of the problems that have plagued Assassin's Creed for years. I hate to say it, but if Ubisoft doesn't follow suit, they could be sealing the coffin on their long-running franchise before it's time. But of course, the true innovation that rocketed this game through the ranks and onto my top 10 list is of course tied to the amazing Nemesis system, a networked AI system that governs the relationship within the ranks of the orcs and their interactions with the player. By allowing the names, personalities, and characteristics of all of the orcs' characters to be procedurally generated, everyone is guaranteed to have their own unique experience. A lot of it might be smoke and mirrors, but you can't deny that it's fucking clever, and it made the game one of the best water cooler games of the year. Throw in skill trees, wild mounts, and some truly awesome wraith abilities, and it's easy to see why Middle Earth will be remembered for years to come. For better or worse, the success of Middle Earth may have cemented Monolith as the Lord of the Rings developer, but if that does prove true, I can't pretend that's not exciting. Also, Ratbag is fucking awesome. So, in 2014, I did something incredible. I went back and I finished Final Fantasy XIII. I plowed through Final Fantasy XIII too, and then I spent 40 plus hours with Lightning Returns. Back to back, and honestly I loved it. And before you roll your eyes to the back of your head, I will admit that it's easy to understand why XIII is not the most fondly remembered Final Fantasy. The game has some issues, with its combat system and even its lore. With that aside, I really enjoyed watching Square Enix fumble and try to recover because we ended up with three distinctly different RPGs set in the same universe, and by the time it was all said and done, I was a fan. Like any good Final Fantasy, Lightning Returns does strike a good balance between original systems, world building, and classic tropes such as chocobos, cactars, etc. Square stripped out the less than stellar supporting cast of playable characters in favor of a game that focuses entirely on lightning. I love the return to the job class slash outfit system that is reminiscent of the system seen in Final Fantasy X-2 as well. You can essentially unlock new classes and then customize their stats, appearance, and loadout, and then switch between them on the fly in battle. Again, not exactly the same, but it was the perfect system to keep the combat feeling fresh in a game that features only one playable character. To make it even better, it required an intimate understanding of each of the classes so that you could master the art of switching to keep the battle flowing at a fast pace. In the end, though, the best parts of Lightning Returns were its new world structure, pacing, and the introduction of a new time-based system. The world is broken up into several large open zones that can be explored <laughs> at will, with each zone having its own atmosphere, side quests, and story missions to complete. Whether it was the lush wildlands or the barren deserts or one of the world's beautiful open cities, for the first time in the entire 13 series, I was genuinely enjoying that sense of exploration. But perhaps most importantly, the game features a time limit. You have 13 days to accomplish your tasks and finish the game. However, accomplishing certain tasks and completing certain missions earns you extra time, so there was a real incentive to fully explore the world. I found myself stretching to squeeze every bit of worth out of each day all the way up until the day ended and I was forced to stop. 
It's a feature we don't see often, but in this case it added so much to the experience. No matter how you cut it, Lightning Returns was a unique experience, and one that was born from an effort to recoup development costs and save face for one of the biggest franchises in gaming history. It's a complicated situation, but having spent well over 100 hours with the universe this year, I find myself at peace with this divisive chapter in the history of Final Fantasy. Alright, not gonna lie, it's a goddamn miracle that the Evil Within ended up in my top 10. Hell, it's even stranger that it landed in my top 5. From the get-go, I was put off by an unforgiving camera that had far-reaching effects on the game's combat. But I pressed on. I mean, how could I not? This was the next original IP from Shinji Mikami, the creator of Resident Evil, and it was often described to me as a Resident Evil meets psychological horror, and that sounded like an amazing mashup. What I soon discovered is that this fundamental problem with the camera was something that I could adjust to over time, and once I did, all of the other elements that the game does get right settled into place, and I was in love all over again. First and foremost, I found myself actually enjoying the story, as over the top as it was, because it was so reliant on blending the edges between reality and imagination. Was anything happening to Sebastian in this game really happening? Was he dreaming? It's exactly the kind of context that I came to expect from the more recent entries in the Resident Evil franchise, but never found, to my dismay. Camera problems aside, the combat itself is a near-perfect homage to the style that was born in Resident Evil 4. The combat has weight to it, and weapons make you feel powerful. But what really sealed the deal for me was the basic flow of the game. It's organized into clear-cut chapters with a beginning, middle, and end. A classic gaming trope that seems rare in the genre these days. I loved returning to the hub world via these broken mirrors to catch my breath, read a newspaper, and upgrade my character and his weapons. Again, nothing new, but I found it to be a perfect fit for this game. But most of all, I actually loved the variety the game had to offer. Because of the psychedelic nature of the plot, it was impossible to predict where you would end up next and what horrifying monster would be hunting you down. Oftentimes, the transitions from one area to the next were just as incredible and mindfucky as the areas themselves. I won't spoil it for you, but this game really is a roller coaster ride that any fan of the genre should at least try. Some may argue that PT isn't a game at all, but I couldn't disagree more. It has its own set of rules, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, it has an objective. That objective, of course, comes in the form of the biggest surprise of the year, and one of the most exciting industry-related announcements for me in years. The objective, of course, was to unlock the secret teaser trailer for the next entry in the Silent Hill franchise, an entry that promises to be the love child of Hideo Kojima, of Metal Gear fame, and the twisted creative mind of Guillermo del Toro. Seriously, as far as fantasy teams go, this is an ensemble team that I have actually dreamt up before, so you can imagine my shock when it was confirmed to be real. Mechanically speaking, it's as simple as it comes, but it demonstrates the true power of the medium when it comes to inciting fear. You wake up on the floor in a dark room and then walk through a door without any explanation or context at all. Beyond that door you find an L-shaped hallway. A thunderstorm rages outside while an ominous news story about a recent murder-suicide plays on an alarm clock radio. Each door you come to is locked so you continue to the far end of the hall and proceed through the door, which leads you back to the same hallway as before. You soon find yourself in an endless and inescapable loop, but each time you re-enter the hallway, something is different, until you meet the figure. A ghostly and unpredictable figure that haunts you every step of the way as you try to solve the insanely obtuse puzzles that Konami concocted to hide their surprise announcement. It's genius. It's an absolutely chilling creation, and it doesn't resemble any existing Silent Hill game, so who knows if this is actually representative of this new title. It could completely stand on its own. What I do know is that I was both painfully excited as I played this game and nearly incapacitated by complete dread. To this day, I revel in the thought of this experience, in the memory of it, but I can't bring myself to play it while I'm alone. In fact, it utterly terrifies me to imagine a full-length game like this. I won't be able to fucking play it. I love horror, but I have lines that even I won't cross if I'm playing alone. But that is not why I ranked this on my top 10 list. PT is an incredible experiment. It's a perfect example of how the interactive nature of this industry can be harnessed to build hype and potentially make the difference between a game that sells and a game that flops. And it does all of this while scaring the living shit out of you. 
Talos Principle arrived super late in the year, but it barreled to the top of my list incredibly fast. You play a robotic person, quote-unquote, who awakes in an artificial world and is tasked by God, quote-unquote, to solve a series of puzzles that will apparently provide insight into the nature of consciousness. Narratively speaking, the game gets deep into philosophical quandaries pretty quick and sets a tone that is undeniably different than that of Portal, a game that clearly serves as some sort of inspiration here. The world is littered with several environments that each have their own set of spatial reasoning puzzles. Puzzles are always fun, but the intensity of the challenges builds at a spectacular pace. It's a game in which you learn entirely by doing. For instance, early on, you may pick up a block and place it on a pressure plate, and then experiment to see if a light-reflecting crystal can be placed on top of that block to create new ways to refract light at different angles. And look at that, you totally can do that. A dialogue box or a clever message written on a wall didn't tell me to do this, and from that moment forward, I looked at every subsequent puzzle slightly different. This is the beauty of the Talos Principle. I find the game especially addicting because of how easy it is to move from one puzzle to another. The hub world itself is completely open, and beautiful I might add, allowing you to walk from one room to another without any loading screens. Stuck on a puzzle? Just walk outside and continue on to another puzzle. Sometimes, you can even use laser light sources and reflection points in one room to bounce light clear across the open world into another puzzle room. This was another realization that I had on my own, and the moment it happened, I fucking lost it. I also adore the more philosophical meta-narrative of the game, which comes in the form of reading, uh, documentation, and con- conversating with an AI. I still have a long way to go before I complete the game and discover the true meaning or purpose of these conversations, so I can't really speak to the payoff. With that said, any game that can get me to ask serious questions about the nature of existence is worthy of recognition in my eyes. In short, I consider the Talos Principle to be brilliant. It scratches a familiar itch, but it completely blew my mind by asking some tough questions and putting the concept of learning and adapting into my own hands. It's an experience that isn't over for me yet, and it won't be over until I've solved every puzzle and found every last hidden object. It's that damn good. Try as I may, I cannot deny the complete and total addiction that I had to Far Cry 4. If you remember, Far Cry 3 was my game of the year in 2012, so I have expected to still be burnt out on the series. With that said, Far Cry 4 is in every sense of the word an improvement to an already stellar experience. The fictional nation of Kirat is far bigger and far more vertical this time around, making traversal way more exciting. Tools like the wingsuit and the gyrocopter are all made available very early on, and the ability to rock climb added a whole new dimension to the platforming. Wildlife plays a bigger role in combat scenarios, and just adds a lot to make the world feel more alive. Moments of choice offer several opportunities to affect the outcome of the story, and I actually found several of these moments to be quite tough. In fact, I found myself in one scenario where I was actually able to reverse a decision that I had made mid-mission, an opportunity that I rarely find these days. Honestly though, the number of incremental improvements to the design dock here are just too great to list. What actually surprised me the most, though, was how much I actually enjoyed the story and characters. Ajay Gale's motivation to travel to his family's homeland to scatter his mother's ashes added a sense of realism to the setup that I felt was lacking the last time around. Of course, one thing leads to another, and Ajay gets dragged into the civil war that is being waged against the violent but hilarious dictator Pagan Min. The rest of the supporting cast is also well-developed, and the villains here would all be comfortable in a starring role in the next Bond film. With that said, Far Cry as a series has always had an air of the surreal in this presentation. The game has always respected the laws of physics, but fudges the rules a bit to favor fun over realism. This has never worked better than it does in Far Cry 4. The Civil War conflict is punctuated by moments that involve tripping balls with some free spirit drug addicts, or breaking reality for a trip through the fabled lands of Shangri-La. This willingness to wander from the beaten path is a compromise that I think gives Far Cry its character. It's the reason, along with the insanely addictive nature of its gameplay, that I'm willing to suspend my disbelief and enjoy the ride at face value. There's a sense of freedom and an unquenchable desire to explore that I think makes the world of Far Cry 4 one of the most exciting open worlds out there, and for for that reason, I continue to praise the franchise as the pinnacle of first-person shooters on the market. What more can I say? Sitting high atop my list this year is a game that I not only consider to be my favorite game of 2014, but a game that I expect will eventually find its way onto my top 10 games of all time. After the Aliens Colonial Marines debacle, 
Alien Isolation is a game that had a lot working against it. Luckily, a talented team with a reverence for the source material was exactly what the Doctor ordered because Alien Isolation is far and away what I consider to be the pinnacle of the Alien franchise. The creative assembly perfectly replicated the low-tech future from Ridley Scott's original film, along with the utter sense of dread and loneliness that I consider to be unique to Alien and Alien 3. It's a shining example of less equals more. It made those moments when you did come face to face with the alien that much more exhilarating. The world itself was beautiful and familiar, I couldn't put the controller down. In this case, my desire to see what happened next far outweighed the fear that threatened to impede my progress. Of course, that doesn't mean that I didn't spend my fair share of time hiding under tables and inside of lockers, as many of you know. With that said, I look back fondly on my progression as a player. As the game progressed, I couldn't help but become more bold in my actions. I would often take risks out of desperation knowing full well that I might die as a result. The beautiful thing though is that as my confidence grew, as did my skills at survival. It may sound kind of cheesy, but I did in a way feel like Ripley in the original film. Terrified, but confidence. And this confidence led to some of the most heart-pounding moments that I've ever experienced in my time playing games. The feeling of relief that I felt after narrowly escaping death is a feeling that I will remember for years to come. The Alien may be the star of the show, and it is brilliantly executed, but I can't wrap up without at least mentioning the average Joes. The Creative Assembly could not have found a better way of mixing things up. These android enemies are terrifying, but fun as hell to fight. They added a welcome sense of variety to the gameplay, and also served as a terrifying obstacle when trying to desperately avoid drawing the attention of the Alien. In the end, I consider Alien Isolation to be a crowning achievement for a series that desperately needed a win. It's packed full of atmosphere, terror, and a slew of smart game design choices that I wish I had time to recap here. Like the acclaimed Riddick game of, from 2004, Alien Isolation should serve as a bright example of how a beloved franchise can transcend the negative pitfalls of licensed games, if handled with care by a devoted studio. It also just happens to be a damn good horror game that nobody should dare miss. Well, 2014 is a wrap. It was a fun year, if not a bit controversial, but the excitement of a new generation of gaming is enough to keep my spirits high. Thank you so much for listening. Let us know in the comments what your personal top 10 was, and we hope you'll join us in 2015 over at 4PlayerNetwork.com for another exciting year. We'll see you later.